Welcome to this episode of Careers Takeoff, where we learn the very latest about how people get ahead in their careers. I'm your host, Conrad Chua. 2020 was a difficult time for graduates looking for jobs. Many companies put temporary freezes on hiring, or they actually shed jobs. International travel was severely curtailed, and that had an impact on cross-national hiring. We see these trends play out in the employment report for last year's CJBS MBA class. I'll walk through the main headlines, and you can get more information on the website itself. So you can go to this uh, URL to take a look at the, the website, and or you can do uh, look at the QR code. My colleague, Margaret O'Neill, will also join us for questions. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, remember, post your questions on, those, on, any, on the respective platform, and we'll go through them. So first, an overview about how a business school prepares an employment report. We are part of the MBA Career Services and Employers Alliance, or MBA CSEA, and they have a certain, they have certain standards for data collection that we have to follow. First, there are standards on timing. So we have to survey our graduates three months after they've completed their studies. The survey is open for one month, and then we have another month to check and analyze data before we publish it. Then there are standards about minimum response rates that we need to hit. MBA CSEA requires schools to have knowledge of the employment outcomes of 85% of the graduates. Now, when they say knowledge of the outcomes, it could come from the survey returns, or from LinkedIn, or from documented conversations, emails with the graduates. In this employment report, we had information on 90% of our class. On to the survey results. The first data point is the percentage of students who received and accepted job offers three months after graduation. I want to make one important distinction here is, well, what is a job seeker? And it's easy to think that, well, all MBAs are looking for jobs, but we actually have students who start a business or who are sponsored by their companies and are returning to maybe a new role within that company. We also have students who, after their MBA, continue with further education. Or there are others who decide to take a career break. All those categories that I mentioned, entrepreneurs, sponsored students, uh, continuing education or taking a career break, are not considered job seekers. So they're not in the denominator. And in our employment report, 72% of the students we had destination information for were job seekers. Now, of the job seekers, 85% received a job offer within three months of graduation, and 83% accepted a job offer within that time frame. This was a drop from 94% and 90%, respectively, from the previous year. It isn't surprising given the economic conditions of 2020. Now, while MBA CSEA only requires us to track employment outcomes for three months after completion of studies, we also survey students who were still seeking jobs. We surveyed them four months after the completion of studies. And what we saw was 92% had received job offers within four months and 88% had accepted job offers. So this might point to an improvement in the job outcomes in the early part of 2021. Just a reminder here, I know some people are uh, looking at this, but please uh, look at, start, start posting your questions um, about uh, in the comments, right? The next section looks at career transitions. As always, most of our students made some form of career transition, and 96% switched 
at least one of the following, the country, the industry, or the job function. One thing that did jump out is the lower percentage of job seekers who switched countries this year. This year, 47% switched countries compared to 64% a year earlier. We think that the global lockdown and difficulty in traveling contributed to this. Many students uh, were, stayed home in March 2020. They left the business schools uh, when lockdowns happened. They went, home, went closer to home. And they had to confine their job search closer to home. We also see a big drop in the percentage of MBA 2019s who stayed in the UK. 40% stayed in the UK compared to 54% the previous year. Next, we look at different sectors. The big story here is there was a big drop in terms of the people going from, to consulting. So previously, we had 29% of the previous class going to consulting. And in this year's class, or the MBA 2019, it dropped to 17%. This was due to many of the recruiting firms pausing recruitment during the year. We did see a pickup towards the later part, and McKinsey and BCG were actually some of, two of our top employers. Now, finance and industry picked up the slack. We were pleasantly surprised to see some students, more students, go into investment banking when previous years, class people, uh, people in previous years, were focused more on other parts of finance. Yet again, technology and e-commerce were a big hire for our MBAs. Lastly, we have salaries. Now, we present salaries in two ways. First, by converting everything, all the local currencies to British pounds. And second, by converting all those currencies by PPP or purchasing power parity to convert to US dollars. Now, if we look at the average base salary in British pounds, there was a drop from about 73,000 pounds to 67,000 pounds. If measured in PPP terms, there was a smaller change from 122,600 US dollars to 117,000 US dollars. The more, we think that the, the higher than usual number of students who return home rather than switching to the UK probably contributed to that disparity. As with all these numbers, there's lots of variation across you know, bonuses and packages. So we, we like to, we tend to look at just that average base salary uh, as, the, as a benchmark. And at this point, I just want to bring uh, onto the live stream my dear colleague, Margaret O'Neill. She's the head of careers. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And we can um, take any sort of questions. We don't, I don't see any questions yet for us. Uh, but again, if you want to uh, post your questions, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn, please do so. We'll put them on, and then we can answer those questions. Um, but Margaret, were there, was there anything else you wanted to add to that short presentation about the employment report? Yeah, I think you covered uh, most most of the bases there. Um, I think, it, you know, after a really difficult year, um, I think it really showed the tenacity and the commitment of our students that they got these um, these roles um, uh, despite all the, the the difficult circumstances that they they were facing. So we're really proud of them. Um, I think when you talked about salary, um, this, the kind of slight side disparity down to sixty seven, some of that's explainable by PPP. And I think some people were prepared to make compromises in order to stay where they wanted to stay or to uh, work in a particular sector they wanted to work to. And given the challenging circumstances, people might have been prepared to negotiate less hard than they might have been in a more buoyant year. Um, I think that's probably um, playing out there as well. Um, and we have, you know, or, you know, as you say, although consulting uh, was down to 17%, ironically, BCG and McKinsey were two of our bigger, our biggest uh, uh, recruiters and when we say big recruiters we say a handful because we've only got 200 in the class um, 
but other recruitment really was flat and we're already seeing a bounce back on that this year so we've already seen all the recruiters that were holding fire last year have, have come back on campus this year so it was a really difficult challenging year um we are seeing a bounce back already um but um you know absolute ha hats off to our students for navigating that well margaret we've got a couple some, some mm -hmm. questions coming in. Um, so the first one is um, from Shruti uh, on LinkedIn. And Shruti saying the UK is opening now. What will be the main format of classes this coming year? Um, and I think this, I will take this question along with mm -hmm. this one from Nick, which is asking, will the MBA be able to be done online? So Nick and Shruti, the MBA for uh, September starting on, it's going to be fully in face to face in person. There won't be a, it will, cannot be done fully online. Um, we've looked at the what what has worked over the last one and a half years, and we found that going to a face to face model with smaller uh, in person classes where there's a lot more discussion really helps and really helps the learning experience. And that's what the students who went through that in Michaelmas. Uh, that means the September of last year, they, they fed back. They really enjoyed it. The faculty enjoyed that kind of discussions. Um, we will also be looking at different ways to help our students in terms of the preparatory material. So whether that's in terms of case studies, pre-readings, maybe some videos that they need to watch so that people can do the pre prep work uh, at their own pace. So there may be some people with a lot of experience and they can go through the material very quickly. Others who need more time can pause, let's say, a video. They can rewatch it um, before they come into those smaller face-to-face uh, -face discussions. This is what we found has been a great improvement in, compared to the kind of teaching we were doing uh, pre-COVID, where you'd have a class, a very large class, people with different abilities. And it was very difficult for faculty to teach when there might be someone with 10 years of experience in finance versus someone who had zero, right? So this format, we, we, we feel we, f we found to be very good in terms of lev making sure everybody's on the same level playing field and then using that in-person time much more constructively to do discussions. Uh, people can interact and engage with faculty and their classmates a lot better. Um, next question, I think uh, we'll go to you, uh, Margaret. This is from... Mm -hmm. Maurizio Ceballos. So of the 40% of students who stayed working in the UK, what percentage of them were already working in the UK prior to the MBA? To be honest, I'm not quite sure. I know that we have less than 10% of the class were UK nationals. So 90% um, plus of our class are non-UK nationals. Um, some of them, of course, will have been working in the UK um, already. I'm not quite sure. I'd need to double check on the stats for that. But as far as my memory serves, um, I think it would be about half and half. But I don't hold me to that. Um, well, there I guess, you Maurizio, you, you can go to the website and you can see that you know 47% you know switched countries, 62% mm -hmm. of those who did switch countries moved to the UK. So that's just over yeah. half. And um, yeah, so you you can see quite a bit there that there was quite a a good switch in terms of the people who stayed on in the UK, there was quite a number who were switching over to the From UK another, itself. Yeah. yeah. Apologies, I didn't have that, that detail. Uh, next question is from Priyan. Mm -hmm. Priyan Dafta, um, do we get any insights into the actual numerical data uh, of numbers that went into organizations such as Google, Amazon, uh, I guess not just tech. So I think it's probably like the yeah. top employers. Yeah. So as I said, our top employers last year were Amazon, McKinsey and BCG. And we'd normally say in a class of, you know, 200, five or six is a top employer for us. Um, and generally we'd find most of all, most organisations will recruit on a single basis for the right role for the right person. So um, Amazon, I the ones that would be recruiting in more than um more than uh just ones or twos um Marco, can then, you just repeat I, th I think you, you might have broken up broken up a bit oh sorry so um yeah so 
Um, Amazon has been a top recruiter for the last few years. And um, when we say top recruiter, I think the most they've taken from us is 12. And that varies between 6, 8, 10, 12, depending on the year. Um, McKinsey and BCG, I think, took five and four from us respectively uh, last year. And most organisations will recruit the right person for the right role just in time as a, as a one off. So, you know, we have, say, over 80 organisations recruiting from um, from the Cambridge MBA every year. We don't tend to give the details of those that are recruiting in ones and twos because it identifies individual students and we're not supposed to be doing that. So what we do on the employment report is we aggregate all the employers that recruit from us so you can see the, the range of recruiters that come to um, come to us for talent. Okay. I, I'm just going back to Maurizio's uh, quite earlier question because I, I just pulled up something from <laughs> that Claire gave us. Um, and so... Uh, of the people who accepted an offer in the UK, 72% came from outside the UK. So mm -hmm. there's still quite a lot of people um, who continue to stay on, I mean, in the UK after their MBA. So hopefully that, yeah. that answers that question, uh, yeah. Maurizio. Now, we've got a question from Jorge Velasco Azonas. Margaret, can you t talk a little about yeah. the graduate root visa, how it can be a tool post-graduation? So we're very excited about this and we've been excited about it for quite some time because the government have been talking about it um, for several years. It is now open to the current class um, and it will be for the incoming class. So from anyone who's um, in the country and having been in on the course um, in July will be um, eligible to apply for the uh, postgraduate uh, visa. Um, which would allow them to stay two years in the UK post-graduation without the requirement to be sponsored by um, an employer. Um, there's still advantages and disadvantages. You know, obviously, if, a, if an employer sponsors you, it's generally at their expense and um, it can lead towards your um, qualification for if you want a residency later um, and it can be renewed. Um, but it's a really great opportunity for those that really want to experience life in the UK. And it extends your... Um, it extends your decision time, I suppose, but it also extends your opportunities to not feel the stress of I've got to get a job by X date or I'm going to be out of the country. It actually allows you to be more reflective and more intentional in your choices. So we're really pleased about that opportunity. It also means that you can make yourself available to a broader range of, of companies that might not have a, a government sponsorship um, license. Most of the... You know, lots of in fact all the big companies you know there's tens of thousands of, of government um visa licenses but for maybe a small startup or a company you're really keen to engage with you can present yourself as a ready to go candidate so that's a real advantage we've got uh i think somebody on linkedin said in-person discussions with cohort and faculty would be much more enriching i i believe this was a comment uh, based on what the answer to the previous question about how we're combining that kind of small uh, in-person teaching with smaller discussion groups and oh, making sure that people have uh, come yeah. into those discussions with the same level of understanding of whether it's corporate finance, accounting, whichever yeah. sort of subject, and making that kind of in in class experience much more much more enriching, much more stimulating. Yeah. It did really work this year. I mean, people were saying that it allowed people to work at their own place. And when they came to those discussions, they were far better prepared. And people were more prepared to speak up because they felt they'd managed to imbibe that information and, and work on it and be be ready for the for the what is, you know, um, supervision practice is a very Cambridge tradition. And they were very happy to be part of that. So, Margaret, there's a couple of questions, I think, looking mm -hmm. at asking about the outlook. So I think Yogesh is mm -hmm. asking how can we expect how far can we expect MBA jobs in the market for freshers and Yogesh followed up with saying struggling to see MBA related jobs in the online market any other ways can you share um, so I guess maybe Margaret if you talk a bit about let's say looking yes. forward the prospects but also yeah. actually in this environment how should people get those jobs yeah so I, I would always say 
the MBA in Europe, so the MBA in, was born in the USA. It's a very, it's an American institution and quite often in the States, it's a means to an end. So you get this and you can't go any further unless you've got an MBA and it's a requirement as part of your progression. In Europe, it's very different. This is a, this is a skills and an experience that you're going to be building and developing that helps you develop as, um, as a leader. And then you need to be expounding that value to the, the the recruiters so the structured hire recruiters the people that come for the MBA programs um, on in September they know the MBA very well and they know the value of it and they know what it means and they know what you can you can bring for those other just-in-time hiring programs it's up to you and us making you be the best version of yourself to talk about what you've learned on the MBA and how that allows you to add value to the company so an MBA, you know, going to someone and saying, I've got an MBA, employ me, isn't good enough. You need to say, this is how it means that I can add value to you. This is how it means that well, I can hit the ground running on day one. This is this means that I can work with any any company, any 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 team anywhere in the world. This means that I can do X, Y, Z. So um, there are MBA specific jobs, but there are thousands of um, other roles where your MBA will allow you to be a real differentiated candidate. Your unique selling point would be to differentiate yourself and to make yourself a compelling candidate in that market. So although there's um, MBA Exchange, we have you know we have MBA Exchange, we have uh, our new um, jobs platform, which which ha which ha not only highlights jobs that have been posted uniquely to us, but also um, other um, MBA roles from from around. Europe and the world are posted to it. But we always say, look beyond the jobs postings platforms. It's about building your brand, building a reputation, building your network, making yourself a really compelling candidate, talking to people, doing informational interviews, making sure you've got an advocate in that company that you really want to work for that um, understands you and can advocate for you in that company. So there's more than one way um, about just looking online. I always call the online market the online portal of doom because you press, you know, ding, you press your application and it goes along with every other MBA in the world into that inbox. That's not a way to differentiate yourself. The way to differentiate yourself is to stand out from the crowd and to really show you've done your homework. And that's that's the way, that's what we do. We work with you to help you build the confidence, the presence, the impact, your skill set such that you can present yourself as a really compelling candidate. And that's our role with you in careers. Thanks very much, Margaret. There's The next question is from Mary-Kate Marino from LinkedIn. As we return to more in-person experiences, are you seeing stronger employer demand this year than you did last year? Yeah. So we do, we already, we're already seeing a bounce back um, and we're seeing um, far more... Um, so we've we've done well this year in in uh, in McKinsey and uh, BCG already. We've got some some good offers under the belt already, and there's still half a year to go for those students. Um, for also for experienced hire, um, I would say there's a stronger demand. It's a, it's allowed us to reach more, more far, virtual recruitment has allowed us to reach far more broadly and to work in alliances um, with other schools as well. So we we're able to um, have a bit of a uh, critical mass when we present ourselves to to recruiters I will say virtual recruitment I think is here to stay it's worked really well for recruiters some want to come on campus but a lot of them have said this has worked really well for us they think they can see candidates um, as effectively on uh, on a call where they have to unmute themselves or ask a question it allows quieter candidates to be visible um, it allows people to ask questions that are that, that are memorable and you know they say you know if I'm surrounded one of the one of the people said to me at a conference recently um, a, an MBA recruiter said if I'm at a post um, you know a, a presentation and then I'm standing around in in the common room having a warm glass of white wine and and a volavant afterwards and I'm surrounded by MBAs I can't differentiate but on that call I could see who asked me the sensible question I make the note I can see their face I can see how they present themselves so I think virtual recruitment is here to stay. I think some will still come on campus and our local companies certainly will as well. The big boys will, will come back on campus because I think they, they enjoy it and they want, they want that experience. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, we've definitely seen a, a, a certainly, I think this year's class is going to have a, a, a better time than did last year's, uh, you know, last year's class. It was, a, it was tough. Yeah, but I, I would also say, um, Margaret, that uh, 
going this this global acceptance of the yeah. online format means yeah. that we could be doing we we've done a lot more uh, yeah. things that we couldn't do before. So just yeah. yesterday we had uh, an alumni panel with mm -hmm. uh, alumni from Deloitte, and the week before that it was uh, no sorry the day before was Amazon. Uh, the week before that we had alumni in product management, and we had alumni calling in from uh, Singapore, Bangkok, the US. Europe, yeah. I mean, different time zones, and it would have been so difficult and pretty much yeah. impossible to have organized that in the past. But yeah. um, that's one great thing from Zoom, which is that now yeah. everybody's going online, uh, they, they can contribute, and we had breakouts. And I, I thought the, the whole session was really good for yeah. getting students to understand uh, the alumni perspectives of yeah. working in these areas and companies. Yeah, the alumni have been amazing. And I have to say, it has been an absolute gift this year. So we've used them far more than we've been able to. We've had alumni, as you say, from all over the world, helping out, talking to us, networking. We've had cross-program, cross-geography uh, cross network, virtual networking events that have worked super well. So, yeah, that's that's been a huge advantage. This question is a, um, from AH on YouTube. What percentage of CJBS MBA graduates end up in management or strategy consulting like MBB, Monitor Deloitte, Strategy N? So uh, the last, the employment report, we had 17% of the, the students that we know of going into uh, consulting. So obviously, uh, and a good number of them, I would say, mm -hmm. went into management consulting mm -hmm. uh, with a good number in McKinsey and BCG. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be right, Margaret? Yes, that's right. And I think... Um, I think it was over 70% went into strategy consulting of that. So, um, yeah, of those, yeah. And 84% of those that went into consulting came from a non-consulting background. So they made that switch. Okay. Um, next question, a really long one from uh, Giwa yeah. Reagan Iziomo. So he asks, in this era that most organizations are implementing digital transformation, is there a specific focus on business technology consulting in the MBA program? This is an area that Giwa is currently exploring given his background in business analytics, commercial, and first degree in mechanical engineering. Well, Giwa, on the program itself, we have a core class on digital business. There is, and for those who want an even deeper dive, there are several electives, and we also have the um, uh, digital transformation um, concentration, right? Now, I think that the thing is, the way that, technology is changing, is touching every industry in some way or another. And whether or not you specialize in terms of business technology consulting or not, uh, all our students need to have, well, we feel very strongly our students need to understand how does technology have an impact. You know, with the digitization of, of technology, things in the cloud, it means that you suddenly, the, the barriers to entry for new entrants becomes drastically lower. It's much easier to scale and roll out things. But there's also this uh, element of once, so you have the technology, how do you use it? How do you localize that uh, to di different regions? And that's what we talk a lot about in the MBA. Um, but Margaret, do you think that there's been an increase in this sort of, in, in companies looking for such skills? For sure. I mean, I think it's no longer... <laughs> No, people said before it's no longer a nice to have it's a now you know it's a hygiene factor now that you have that kind of understanding of, of of digital business it's it's everywhere so what used to be something you know uh that, that that's um or well, that would be useful you need to have you need to have at least the language to have that conversation across the business uh, across the businesses you're working with um so yeah it's core now which is why it's part of our core course also Ankush on LinkedIn asks, how many students were recruited in private equity? Do private equity firms generally recruit MBAs without prior banking experience? Well, interestingly, I was just looking this up. I was just looking this up when I saw that come up. I don't have the statistics to hand, but um, we have always had um, about a third of our finance roles uh, uh, have gone into private equity uh, kind of backgrounds and experience. It's a very networked world. So um, traditionally, you'd always need either IBD or um, a consulting background. Um, increasingly, you need to prove your worth. There's no point in saying I'm really interested in private equity. You have to actually demonstrate 
that you know what it means, that you've done your due diligence, if you've got a little mini portfolio, if you've tracked market trends, if you can go to them saying, this is what I think would be a good investment. That's what they that's what they see. They don't recruit really until the end of the year and there's small, you know, it's going to be one or two into, into firms. Um, but you need to start your networking right at the um beginning of the year if you don't have prior experience because you have to build that relationship before you need it um, and you might need to do um, um, you know doing some project works with them so you can demonstrate your value um, is really important but we have um, we have people every year going into private equity and obviously where we are in Cambridge um, VCP is, is 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 big here um, so um, there's lots of opportunities for that. But it's an advantage if you have an IBD or a consulting background, but it's not impossible to get in otherwise than people do. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at what Claire gave, gave us. And basically, yeah. 20, uh, Ankush, 20 percent of those students who went into finance went into VC or private equity. So I don't have yeah. a breakdown as to for the breakdown, but that that's the stats. Yeah. And um, I'm always remember, reminded of a conversation I had with someone who worked, who has started several private equity firms where he said the, the perception, right, that many MBAs have of working in private equity is that you've got to be a, a modeling whiz kid. And yes, you do need to know the, the numbers, but a lot of deals don't go to the person who has the best spreadsheet. Um, mm -hmm. Because in, in ultimately, it's really, in a way, someone's guess, right? And once, once the deal is, is, is struck, then you finally realize, oh, actually, the numbers were kind of off. But the what he always said that the deals went to those people who all, knew their stuff, but could also build those kind of relationships. Because sometimes you are you're talking to a founder who has spent so many years of his or her life building up this company, and it's really been part of their their family, their their legacy, and you're trying to take over that legacy. And so you need to strike that sort of relationship, right? Because ultimately, you're not competing with the other PE firms on the, on the strength of your spreadsheet modeling, um, but really on the relationship that you can, you had, you've built with the founder, with the management team. So that's, that's the answer to you, Ankush. Um, Margaret, next question is about mm -hmm. environmental sustainability strategy roles and mm -hmm. employment in that sector. Mm. So we haven't gathered that data in that level of detail, but I would say that, you know, um, ESG, CSR, it's now it's core again across all our courses. We're expected to talk about this and to address this. And I think an understanding is needed across wherever you go to, to in employment after there's going to be an understanding and a need for that um, uh it, insights into how that works but we haven't gathered it structured it down into that level of granularity to be able to say people going specifically into those areas and i guess the other thing is that um in the past you would think maybe you're working in a particular consulting group or something but actually every company every large company now has roles uh, that's looking at sustainability or uh, esg so Definitely think, my, my advice to people is always, if you're interested in this area, think about which industry you want to have an impact in, what companies are big in that, that sector, and really start mm -hmm. looking. There will definitely be some area in that company that's looking into uh, ESG. The next question yeah. uh, is by Akanksha. What mm -hmm. percentage of internships or global consulting projects were converted into full-time roles? Gosh, that varies year on year. So we can have some that, um, you know, 10, 20%, and there's others that would be uh, would be more or less. I would say we don't do traditional, we don't call our internships internships. They're work placements. Um, so there'll be um, an opportunity to work with a company over summer for a period to be decided. Um, they can be a route into a full-time employment or it can be what people do to get some experience before they go back to work uh, somewhere else as well. For those um, that are official internships that are publicised, um, they're, the, they're the route in, about 10% of the class do those and most of those would be um, converted into full-time offers. And on the GCP, it depends entirely. Um, 
on the subject area, the the business and and what the need is, but it varies year on year. Um, I don't know about last year, but I think you know again. Um, I think someone uh, a group of five did um, internships with Google uh, two years ago, and two of them got offers from off the back of that with their GCP. Um, Patagonia did a GCP with that and they got an offer out of it. So there's every year there's one or two, but it depends on the student's area of interest and following up. I should also say that quite often those play out beyond the year. So I met an alum just last year who'd um, wanted to do a GCP with um, with an e-sports uh, e company, had tried to pitch it and hadn't managed to get it. Um, he went and worked somewhere else and then the company got back in touch with him um, the following year and said we really like your pitch we weren't ready to employ you then but we're really interested in exploring that now and he's now in his his dream job and again someone who did a um, a GCP with WHO um, was really disappointed not to get a role out of it straight out of the MBA um, and then seven months later they got back in touch with him again and said now we've got we've got an opening so it's about playing the long game there as well not just in the immediate straight after your MBA but those relationships that play out in the future. Yeah, and Margaret, I guess the 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 story, the moral of that, those two stories is keeping is is about relationships and keeping yeah. those relationships warm, yeah. um, and thinking not not thinking very short term and thinking, okay, is there a job? If there's no job, I move up, I move away from this yeah. this person yeah. or this company. But really, just keep keep talking because jobs will come up, roles will come up, uh, maybe not now, but as you say, seven, twelve months later, or even if you've moved into another role, just keep. Keep that relationship going, and you know, after two three years, you might you might be able to mm -hmm. move into that that company. Mm -hmm. um, we've got one question here from Maimoon Salim, who asks mm -hmm. for more granularity into the seven percent graduates who went into pr product management. What sort of roles did they take, and the companies they joined? Yeah, so um, someone's asked for me for this before, and um, I sent back a list of, of job titles, um, which I can certainly dig out and share. We don't share it because it identifies, again, identifies individuals, and because each one will be an individual person, and that's aligned with the salary, etc. cetera. Um, but I can certainly dig into that in, into more detail. Um, it's a range of, it's a range of companies, um, a lot of startups, a lot of um, SMEs who really need um, the you know the uh, the input of an MBA, and I think the value they see of a Cambridge MBA is someone who can uh, be the bridge between the tech and the and the market, um, and that's what most of those roles are aligned around being that bridge, whatever title they call them, because they call them different titles in different in different companies. But the advantage of the Cambridge MBA is to have that um, real experience about the product life cycle. Um, and to be able to man to be, to be able to bridge that story, so um, yeah, that's what I'd say with that one. Yeah, I also add that we had this uh, alumni panel about product management uh, two three weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it was great to see the, how people who wow. came through the MBA moved yeah. into product management in roles like like um, tick tick by dance TikTok. Right, yeah. uh, in Singapore or Agoda.com, both in the mm. London, but also in in Bangkok, um, in a wide range of roles. And I think the the key thing that came out was yes, you need to know a bit about the product, about the, the industry. Um, you actually need to know a lot about the industry. But what is really key is how you, as a person, are able to bring together mm -hmm. different teams, different um, experts. Right mm -hmm. in areas that you could never ever be able to match. Right, so mm -hmm. you've got people who are from marketing, people from uh, the tech side, the product development side. How you can bring? It's really a, a test of how you can bring together all these disparate elements. They might have their own motivations, their own um, interests. How do you get them working in a team really quickly and then start delivering um, results? So well, that that's one thing to think about if you're moving into a product management role. Mm -hmm. um, We've got another question from Maurizio. What percentage of the cohort lines up an internship during the summer? So I've just mentioned that we call this the work placement and the internship, as you would see, a traditional internship um, as the sandwich between a first and second year MBA 
uh, only about 10% of our class would go for those because we're a one year course and they're not returning to the MBA for the second year. And quite a lot of internships are designed for, uh, for a two year MBA. And so the timelines don't really quite line up with ours. So there's a couple of companies, and I'll say it out loud, Bain, for example, their internship deadlines do not line up with ours. We're still in class and we're still in lectures when their internship starts. So we um, then move for full time. We, we go to full time along with INSEAD um, on that. So it, we, we, we've we started um, recruiting, with, we recruit with them about February, March um, for full time offers. So, um, but, but, but about 70% of the class do work placements, which are the equivalent of an internship where they have, they're they working with a company over the summer um, for uh, experience, for impact, and for something on their CV um, on, uh, on a paid, um, on a paid um, project or endeavor. This leads nicely to the next question, which is, again, from Yogesh. Um, are internships required in marketing uh, prior to getting a full-time job? No. <laughs> That's no. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, anything that you've got, if you don't have experience in a particular area, the all the projects, the CVP, the GCP, and the individual project over summer are opportunities for you to build that skills experience to 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 um to fill that gap in your cv and your experience such that you can be a more compelling candidate so if you haven't got any marketing experience there's you know you need to show someone why you'd be a great candidate for that role and if you haven't got the experience to, to demonstrate that it can be tough so using the projects as an opportunity to show what you can do so show don't tell is a great opportunity um so but it's not a requirement but an internship is not a requirement, but demonstrating your impact is and demonstrating the value you can bring is and having some good examples of that is. <laughs> okay, and we've got this, uh, this looks like the last question we have um, from Giwa again. Um, Giwa asks, do you see student loan financing for MBA as a viable option? Any positive stories? Well, Giwa, most of our quite a number of our students actually come in with a combination of uh, maybe some savings, maybe some uh, borrowings from friends and family and, and some loans. So loans at the moment, you know, they, they, they can be quite um, localized or regionalized. So we, we do work with some loan providers that are quite established in the business school sector, um, like Prodigy, StepX, but each country or each region might have a company or a bank or financial institution that specializes in loans, international loans. So I would encourage you to start looking into that quite early. Um, I always tell people if they're preparing for an MBA, right? Start, obviously prepare all the things like GMAT or GRE, take the test, get a reference, think about your essays, but also think about the financing side of things. And it always pays, uh, pun, pun intended, to, to prepare early on that on that score right AH asks is it possible to double major uh, in the CJBS MBA so strategy and finance so um, the the MBA is a general degree right um, it's not here to make you an expert in one or the other areas for if you really wanted to have that sort of deep dive into one particular area you can either um, you can do the MBA choose the concentration and really choose electives based along the, those lines. We do also have people who think, okay, actually, I don't want to do an MBA. I want to do a specialized master's in a particular area. So that's another option. I think it's very important for people to understand what the MBA is about. As I said, it's not trying to make you an expert in strategy or accounting, but it's really to help you understand how all these elements fit together um, how something, a decision that you make in accounting could actually affect the, your strategy, can affect the, uh, the, the culture in your team, in your organization. Um, and that's where I think a lot of companies are looking for the kind of skill sets for an MBA, which is this broad knowledge and understanding how different aspects of a company and organization work together, but also the softer skills uh, and I hate that word soft skills because it's not easy. The, the, what, what, what companies <laughs> are looking for. Yeah. Which is 
how do you work with people right how do you motivate lead people how do you show empathy and listen really listen to them and so that's the thing that uh, an mba really gives you and you've got to think well is this is this what you want or do you want to have, be much more technical in which case a specialized masters would be probably more more appropriate um and ultimately on on in the cjbs mba side you just you get a degree it just says you've got an mba all right so I think that is the last question, and uh, that's all the time we have for today as well. So I wanted to thank, well, first Margaret for joining us. I mm -hmm. um, also want, want to thank all of your viewers, right? You've been a great audience um, with all your questions, with all your comments. And if you want to um, carry on, right, you can just join me and uh, today at 4 o'clock. Uh, if you're on Discord, I'll be there on Discord for 30 minutes. You can see the the uh, URL there, or you can use the QR code um, over over on the corner, right? And you can follow that. Uh, I'll be back in two weeks where we'll have Simone Ehringfeld, a Cambridge graduate, not from the business school. She did an MPhil in the Faculty of Education, but she's also done a lot of work in terms of remote study and remote work. So join me then. But till then, thank you very much. And goodbye. Thank you.